of starting in verse 1. We read, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Boy, isn't that coming, huh? I never think so. And uh, the taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, um, unto the city of David, um, and which is called Bethlehem, and uh, because he was of the house and lineage of David, and uh, to be taxed with Mary, his spouse wife, being great with child. And it was so, and so it was, uh, that while they were uh, there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. And uh, because there was no room for them in the inn, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over them, uh, over their flocks by night, or their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they uh, were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Amen and amen. amen. And uh, there's much more um, to the story, of course. We'll stop right there for now. Away in a manger, no crib for a bear, and fit us for heaven to live with the there. Um, but if you're able, out of respect for the reading of God's word, would you stand with me, please? And we're just going to read verse 6 and verse 7 in Isaiah chapter 9. And it's a familiar passage, I think, to most of us. But um, I'll read out loud if you will follow along silently, please. And again, just verse 6 and verse 7, and I'll begin. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, um, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase, excuse me, of his government and, and peace, there shall be no end. Um, I've got to get a little bit of focus here, excuse me. And the throne of his, um, throne of David, and upon uh, and his kingdom uh, to order it and to establish it um, with the judgment and with justice and from henceforth even forever and the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly, thank, Heavenly Father, thank you for your word uh, is so rich in truth. It is eternal, inerrant, infallible and you have preserved it for all this time, inspired it and preserved it and now we have it before us and Lord, I know that you led us to this passage and others that we will uh, explore <coughs> this morning. And so, Father, please pull back the curtains and show us what you know about these passages. Um, give us your understanding, your insight, your discernment. Teach us what you want us to learn this morning and build us up in the faith and challenge us and um, where we need to be challenged. But... Um, Bring us what you want us to have this morning, and may you be exalted on this day, this Lord's Day. Uh, you daily load us with benefits, but this day, Lord, um, please be extremely gracious to us, and and Lord, just open the windows of heaven and unload to us the fullness of your blessings um, that we might uh, really revel in what a wonderful Savior you have and what a a priceless, invaluable gift you've given us, this unspeakable gift that you've given us in your Son. 
and um, come to earth to take our sins upon himself and become sin for us and to pay our sin debt and to free us up of that great burden and that great guilt and that condemnation and to free us to worship you, to serve you, and to follow you and to glorify you with our lives. That's what we want this morning, Father. So we are so thrilled to be here. May you be glorified as we worship you and adore you this morning. And if there's anybody here today that does not know you as their personal Savior, we pray that today would be the day that you come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you and be seated if you would please. As we come to this passage, we see what is commonly and what sticks out the most to us is there are a series of names here that are given for the Lord Jesus. In the Old Testament and the New Testament combined, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of names for the Lord Jesus. And we'll not take time to explore them all this morning. When you think about names um, and what they mean and how they affect us, um, years ago, a psychologist um, saw fit to do a study on 15,000 juvenile delinquents who were incarcerated, and he began to study their names. And of the names of those juvenile delinquents, those in prison, those incarcerated, he studied the names of those that were odd names, those that were unusual, those names that you and I in society would consider embarrassing names, um, names that kids would get teased about, razzed about, and given a hard time about, names that their parents put on their birth certificates, um, and that maybe thought were funny. They found that those with those type of names were four times more likely to get in trouble and be incarcerated than those that had more common names that were, you know, the, the more soup de jour names, those that were the usual common names. And uh, that, was, that was across the board uh, very common, four times more likely to get in trouble, to go to jail, uh, to be in fights, to be expelled from school, uh, to be constantly in the principal's office growing up. And behind that, they were getting harassed for their names. So names are pretty important when they uh, are getting attached to a person. We think of early on in the Bible, we see Adam name. He was made from the dust of the ground, and Adam means earth. Uh, that's what the name Adam means. But you know, that's not such a bad name. It's a good name. Uh, when you get a, somebody says that um, a person is a really down to earth type of person, that's a compliment. That's a good thing. Um, we think of Abraham and how that God renamed him Abraham from Abram to Abraham. Abraham means father of many nations. And that's very appropriate because he was. Um, I think of Rachel naming her last son because she died in giving childbirth um, to him. And she named him Benoni. Some might pronounce it Benoni, but it means son of my sorrow. And how would you like to go around as a kid um, being uh, uh, shackled with that name because everyone would know that you're the reason your mom died and giving birth to you and everything. But wisely, his father Jacob renamed him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. And so that was pretty good. Uh, we go all the way over to the New Testament and Peter was uh, known as Simon before, Simon Barjona, uh, but um, he was kind of up and down, in and out, off and on, and he was kind of a little bit 
unstable uh, to begin with, but Jesus saw something in Peter, so he renamed him Peter. Thou shalt be called Peter, Jesus said. A rock. That's something a little bit more stable than what his character had been like um, leading up to that time. And so Peter did become more like a rock and was greatly used of God. And because Jesus saw something in Peter and renamed him Peter, thou shalt be called Peter. And um, that confidence that the Lord Jesus put in Simon uh, proved to be warranted and true. So names are pretty important. We could go down through the Bible and see characters in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, that were uh, lived out their names or their being renamed and proved to be true. And, and it was very important. We come to this place here in Isaiah 9 and verse 6. It says, For unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. And before we get to the names of the Lord Jesus here, it's good to get a little bit of background backdrop on this passage so that we know why the names of the Lord Jesus are so important here uh, this morning. Um, unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. This speaks both of the humanity and the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a prediction 700 years <coughs> God speaking through the prophet Isaiah 700 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and it sees both that he is in the flesh, he is the son of man as well as the son of God and he is in his humanity a child that was born, speaks of that being born and Holy Ghost overshadowing Mary and being born in the womb of this young virgin Mary, teenage girl but being very blessed of God and a godly young lady, God choosing this young lady specifically um, as the one who would carry the Lord Jesus for those nine months and then traveling with her husband as we read earlier in Luke 2 for the purpose of being taxed in their own hometown. And it was by no mistake in God's sovereign will that um, he would be born in Bethlehem, the city of David, um, where God wanted him to be born. And it was prophesied in the Old Testament in Micah 5.2 that he would be born there. And so God used the taxation um, being ordered by Caesar Augustus um, uh, to get him to that hometown, both Joseph and Mary being in the line of David. And so unto us a child is born, that's his humanity. But unto us also is a son given. That is speaking of his deity, that he was God in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But the Word, the eternal God, became flesh, John 1.14, and dwelt among us. Amen. And we beheld his glory. That is the radiance, the glory, the radiance of the holy nature of God shown out through this Christ child. And he was not only born in human flesh so that he could take on your sufferings and my sufferings, but he was born in human flesh so that we could see the radiance of the holy nature of God in person. So he could be revealed to you and me. So he could walk this earth but walk this earth in the flesh, yes, but sinless, never to commit one transgression of God's law. He came to fulfill the law, and He did perfectly. The law only had two requirements, perfection and death for imperfection. And Jesus fulfilled both of those requirements. He was perfect in that He did not sin once, never transgressed, one time against God's law. Never committed one sin, one transgression, one act of lawlessness, one iniquity. But he also fulfilled the second part of the law, death for imperfection, and that he went to the cross and died for you and me. And so he was a child born, but he was a son given for that 
specific purpose that he would come and die for you and me. And so as we read earlier, Mary, when she gave birth uh, to Jesus there in Bethlehem, um, she wrapped him in swaddling clothes, clothes that um, the common traveler there in the Middle East would carry with them. They were burial clothes, so that if they died <coughs> along their journey, they would have their clothes to be buried in uh, wherever they traveled. And so she wrapped him in those clothes that were meant for burial. And so it was significant, it was symbolic and picturesque of this small infant, this newborn baby, to be wrapped in clothes that were meant for burial. And so this Christ child, child is born, humanity, but a son given um, to be given for you and me so that he could be our substitute. Big fancy word, vicarious. He was the vicarious one, the one that would die in your place and my place to take our place upon the cross of Calvary because he did uh, not sin, but you and I did. And so he came to become sin for you and me so that the government would be upon his shoulder. I'd like to point out something if you would look at your Bible in verse 6. And he says that he's unto us as a child is born and unto us as a son is given. But look at that word given. And the, there's a colon there in your Bible. And the next word is and. And the government should be upon his shoulder. But between the word given and the word and, so far there has been about 2,000 years. Because you see, the government being upon his shoulder has not taken place yet. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. That hasn't taken place yet. That is still future. So there's been about 2,000 years uh, pass thus far, and we're looking out in the future before the government will be upon his shoulder. That comes after what we're looking at, where we're sitting right now, on December 25th, 2022, is the next event on God's prophetic calendar, is the rapture of the church. That is when we as God's people, the bride of Christ, collectively are caught up together to be with the Lord, to meet Him in the air, <coughs> in the clouds, as He comes back for us. And then we will join Him there as we hear the trumpet sound of God's archangel. And then we will rise, the dead in right, and Christ will rise first. The grave of those that went um, before us by virtue of death, um, as their uh, souls and spirits are already in the presence of the Lord, but their bodies are in the graves. Their graves will open and they'll rejoin their souls and spirits and they'll rise just immediately ahead of us. And then we will um, also join them immediately behind them to meet the Lord in the air and we'll go back to heaven for the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's the next thing on God's prophetic calendar. And uh, there are no signs um, preceding that unless you want to talk about the... Um, uh, there are no signs that we will see, uh, so to speak, or no signs that will precede it that we have any warning of. The trumpet will sound, but it'll be so quick. Uh, we will, it'll happen uh, in the blink of an eye, God says. And so, um, um, practically speaking, no signs, if you know what I mean. Um, and then the tribulation period uh, comes, seven year period of God's pouring out His wrath upon this earth. And uh, we will be in heaven uh, as God's people. We will not endure that as the scriptures tell us we are not appointed to that period of God's pouring out His wrath upon this earth. But immediately following that seven year period of, of tribulation upon this earth, we return with the Lord, um, riding white chargers uh, behind the Lord, um, <clears throat> with Him riding a white charger. And He will step foot on the Mount of Olives. It will split wide open with a river of life proceeding from it down to the Dead Sea. But He will immediately proceed to the Valley of Armageddon when there's, where there's a war uh, going on. And uh, it will look like uh, Israel is about ready to 
um, be annihilated, but they will not be annihilated. And Jesus will crush the enemy of Israel to where the enemies of Israel, which will be um, virtually, and really not virtually, but every nation on earth will be represent, represented there, and Jesus will crush them to where their blood will rise the height of horses' reins throughout that valley for a distance of approximately 200 miles uh, from north to south. And then uh, he will set up his reign on earth. That's when the government will be upon his shoulders. That's what this verse is talking about. But so far, there has been about 2,000 years between the word given and the word and. And so we know that there'll be at least 2,007 years before the word, between the word given and the word and. If the Lord were to have the angel, uh, archangel sound that trumpet while we're sitting here this morning, there will be at least 2,000, around 2,007 years before the government will be upon his shoulder. And that's what we're looking at right now. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And that will be a blessed time. Amen. That'll be a wonderful time. Right. And uh, just to tell you a little bit about what that will be like, I'd like you to hold your place here, but go over to chapter 11 in Isaiah. Chapter 11. And I'd like you to look at verse 4. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And the righteousness shall be, um, uh, him be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Verse 6, And the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall be um, shall lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed uh, their young ones, and lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the suckling, uh, sucking child shall play on the hold of the asp, asp and the wean child shall um, put his hand on the cockatrice den, and they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth <clears throat> shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Um, there is so much more, and we could go on through the book of Isaiah um, and talk more about what the millennial reign of Christ will be like when the government shall be upon his shoulder for that thousand year period on earth here. But the character of that day, unlike this day, when the wickedness and perverseness and the corruption of this day is rampant and permeates every facet of society, um, when the heart of man um, is wicked above all things and deceitful and desperately wicked, as Jeremiah 17 and verse 9 says, the character of that day when Jesus is on the throne is peace and righteousness and joy. And that's when the government is upon his shoulder. And the thing about it is, before though, the government will be upon his shoulder, he will take a, he has had taken a cross upon his shoulder. Back there in Jerusalem, um, almost 2,000 years ago now. And before he could wear a royal diadem, before he could wear a crown, a golden crown upon his shoulder filled with precious jewels, adorned with precious jewels, he had to take a cruel uh, crown of thorns <coughs> upon his head and have it beaten to his brow and have streams of blood come down his face. And then he had to have a cross placed upon his shoulder there in Pilate's judgment hall and step out of that hall onto the Via Della Rosa and begin to carry it down those rough stones that 
great distance from that judgment hall till Golgotha's hill and then not be able to bear up under the weight of that cross and have Simon Cyrene of Cyrene um, help him and be ordered to help him carry that cross the rest of the way and suffer for your sins and my sins. It would be over 2,000 years then between the time that that son was given and the government would be upon his shoulder and he would get the full glory that he deserves by sitting on that throne in his millennial kingdom. But then we follow our verse <coughs> when it says, unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And when we follow these names, they're assigned to the Lord Jesus Christ by our Heavenly Father, by the Holy Spirit of God in inspiring Isaiah to pin these words um, 700 years before the birth of Christ and now 2,700 years before you and I are seated with open Bibles on our laps and before us today. We read these words um, that assign these names that speak of His character, that speak of who He is and speak of also, and I want to remind you, and I want you to go in your mind's eye and your heart's understanding this morning of who He is to us and what He does for us, that in this description of our Lord Jesus, it says His name shall be called Wonderful, because He is. This speaks to us that He takes away for us, if you know the Lord Jesus here this morning as your personal Savior, then when you receive the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, you were born again. You were regenerated. And this opened a whole new world to you. First of all, because you were brought to a place in your life where you were miserable, where you were not happy with the life that you were living. God brought you to that place on purpose. That some sort of trouble in your life, some sort of misery in your life, some sort of anguish in your life brought to you to a place where you were willing to consider yourself and your life for what was really going on in your life and the truth about yourself and the truth about your sin and the truth about the Lord Jesus and the truth about the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection. And you were not happy. And so this fact of the fact that Jesus' name is wonderful because He is wonderful and He is taking away the dullness that was going on in your life and the misery that was going on in your life. And He brings wonder into your life where there was a lot of dullness and misery and perhaps pain and sorrow. And now you look at the Lord Jesus and you see how wonderful He is. And the closer you get, the better He looks. Hallelujah, amen, glory to God. Because one of the things He did is right away you see where He could lift your sin burden and take that away from you and place it on Himself. So you saw right away that He had a love for you that you did not deserve and I did not deserve. So how much more wonderful could He get that He would suffer for your sins and my sins upon the cross of Calvary and take that pain and agony Physically, yes. But also the shame and disgrace and degradation that was being inflicted upon him where he would have his beard plucked for him as he stood perfectly still below Caiaphas' house down in that dungeon and have those soldiers and others pluck his beard from his face and spit in his face and slap him with open hands and slug him with clenched fists 
and mock him and ridicule him and jeer at him and call him names and have him like a sheep before her shears is dumb, meaning mute, and not speak a word. And have him falsely accused of crimes that he did not commit, of all kinds of blasphemy, and not even have him open his mouth one time to defend himself. And have him ask numerous times, aren't you going to defend yourself? And have him not say a word. And to get that picture in your heart, your your heart, and in your mind's eye, and know that he did that for you, isn't he wonderful? Isn't he a marvelous and wonderful and tremendous Savior? Amen. His name is wonderful. That he would do that for you and I, and continue to take that punishment and that shame and disgrace. And what a wonderful Savior that even after you and I are saved, that He would continue to be faithful to you and I when we are not as faithful as we should be. When numberless and countless times we have been unfaithful to Him and when we have let Him down and we have sinned after we have been saved and we have had to come back to Him on bended knee and with a bent neck and a bent and lowered head and ask God to forgive us for sins we've committed and for our unfaithfulness and asked Him again and again and again to forgive us. And He with open arms and with mercy and grace has said, I forgive you. What a wonderful Savior that He has been so faithful. And He has taken all the dullness of life. When we compare all the things that we have tried to find excitement in and we have tried to find thrills in in this world and we have, we have dived in deep or we dove in deep to the things this world had to offer only to find that we came up empty into money and riches and to try to build up our bank accounts and to the material things we tried to accumulate all the toys houses and lands and maybe fashions and um, material things possessions fame popularity fortune accomplishments in the area of sports or work or vocation and careers and notoriety and accumulate friends and people around us only to find that we weren't happy. Whether it be local fame or regional fame or nationwide fame, you hear the stories all the time of celebrities who try to accumulate their fame and fortune. But when it gets down to the core of their hearts, they're not happy. They're not. And the truth of the matter is they may try to put on a happy face, but when they're alone, they're miserable. And when they're asked to bear their hearts and give the truth, they're miserable. Solomon, one of the wisest men that ever lived, in fact, the wisest. The Bible testifies to that, that God gave him wisdom beyond any man that ever lived or ever will live. He tried women. He had 300 wives and 700 concubines. That didn't work. He tried being a developer and a contractor. He was the greatest amongst that crowd that ever lived. Built things that have never been built before, way beyond and way ahead of his time. He tried alcohol, wine, partying, friends, accumulating spices and animals. He tried education, 
he was a, an expert in every field of education and smarter than any man and wiser than any man that ever lived in his time and beyond his time to this day. He tried everything. There were queens and kings who sent him shiploads of gold and silver and precious jewels laden down so heavy that they barely made it into the harbors in Israel. Barely made it into the harbors. They were so weighted down with these riches. And after it was all said and done, Solomon surmised this. He said, all of it was vanity and vexation of spirit. He said, when I, after I pursued all these things, he says, vanity means empty, futile, worthless. Vexation of spirit means I was miserable and troubled. He says, I was more miserable after pursuing all these things than I was before because now I wasted time. I wasted my life pursuing those things. Life and time, I can't get back. And now I wasted all that life pursuing those things and now I can't get it back. And I came up empty. I dove in deep and came up empty. And the sad thing about it is, is Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived and nobody will believe him. They got to go out there and try it for themselves. What Solomon concluded, he said, this is the whole conclusion of the matter. You read the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is one sermon. You got to read it all at once. Twelve chapters. Read it all at once. In one sitting. And at the end of chapter 12, he says, this is the conclusion of the whole matter. This is what man is created for. This is the whole duty of man. To fear God and keep His commandments. It's the whole duty of man. That's when you'll be happy. That's when you'll feel fulfilled and like you fulfilled the purpose you were created for. Fear God and keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man, he said. But people won't believe Solomon. So they got to go out there and do it themselves and be miserable. Vanity, vexation of spirit. And they find out that his name is wonderful. When you give your life, here's the deal. Now let's go through this and then I'll conclude. Counselor, his name is Counselor. See, <coughs> when you give your life over to the Lord Jesus, you'll find out that he is wonderful. But he's also the counselor um, that takes care of all the decisions of life. Him being wonderful takes care of the dullness of life. Him being the counselor takes care of the decisions of life. He's got all the wisdom. He is wisdom and knowledge and understanding. He's a personification of all those things. And him being the counselor and having all wisdom, all knowledge, all understanding, um, if any man would lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. Um, Proverbs, that's um, James 1. Proverbs 2, 6 is, uh, with regards to the Lord, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. So he's got everything we need. When you leave all the decisions to the Lord Jesus Christ, what a weight it takes off of our hearts and our minds. You just turn everything over to him. And uh, he is the counselor. And he is the teacher. And he is the um, um, one who's got all the wisdom, all the knowledge, all the understanding. Um, the wisdom of man is foolishness to God. Um, the Lord through the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians. And so um, all those decisions turned over to the Lord Jesus Christ and you find out that what a, a peace there is in not struggling to try to make all the decisions ourselves, but to turn over all those decisions to the Lord because he is the counselor of all counselors. The mighty God, um, 
he meets all the demands of life. And um, we need strength. He is our strength. And so uh, the mighty God, the Elohim, that created everything and spoke everything into existence, that strength that he has, he not only gives to you, but he, as a child of God, he is our strength. And so he meets all the demands of life. How many demands are on us every single day? And we feel overwhelmed as fathers, as mothers, as um, husbands, as wives, as sons, as daughters, as brothers, as sisters, as businessmen, as um, employees, as employers, um, in every facet of life, as teachers, as students, um, as neighbors, as um, every aspect of life that we find ourselves in. He is the mighty God, and when we turn our lives over to Him, we find out that He is there to meet every demand that is in our life. He is our all and our everything, and so He meets all the demands of life. The everlasting Father, He is the eternal God. That makes Him the Creator because He existed before anything ever existed. And as the everlasting Father, that means He has an everlasting Son. They are one, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, so if He is eternal and He is everlasting, that takes care of all the dimensions of life. In every aspect of your life, in every dimension you find yourself in, you find yourself, say in my case, as a um, husband, as a father, as a father-in-law, as a grandfather, as a pastor, as a neighbor, as a community member, um, and we could go on and mention as a brother, um, a as um, a friend, every dimension that you fulfill in your life um, is fulfilled in, and can be helped and supported and held up by He who is everlasting because He is <coughs> the great I Am from the beginning to end, and He is and always will be, and He is God. Right. Um, and so, as the everlasting, and you talk about the Prince of Peace, that takes care of all the disturbances of life, right. because He is the Prince of Peace. And so, everybody in the whole world, if um, you were to take a survey and said, what do you need most more than anything else? Probably the vast majority of the answers around the world you'd get a lot of different answers and everything from, from different people and they would uh, be varied. But probably the answer you'd get most is peace. What people want most is peace. But here it is, he's the Prince of Peace that takes care of all the disturbances of life. And so you've got the Prince of Peace right here. And so how does that work? Well, do I have to wait over 2,000 years, 2,007 years plus, till Jesus sets up on his throne after the tribulation during the millennial kingdom and have the government be upon his shoulder in order to take advantage of him being wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, and the answer is no. You don't have to wait that long. First of all, if you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal savior, today can be the day that you can put the government, um, his government, uh, and have him uh, take over the government of your life. And uh, you don't have to shoulder all those things that you've been trying to shoulder in your life. And you don't have to um, uh, struggle as you've been struggling and be miserable as you've been miserable and um, try to bear up under the weight of this world and uh, shoulder everything because you can have Jesus shoulder those for you. He started when He shouldered the cross of Calvary for you. Right. And He took the weight of your sins upon Himself and became sin for you when He died on Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago and became the sin bearer for you. And what a wonderful thing it was. He took your shame, your disgrace, your degradation, and the penalty for your sin upon Himself. What a wonderful thing it is to come to the cross of Calvary and humbly admit that you are the sinner that he died for 2,000 years ago. That can start today. And he can bear that sin for you. And that's where it starts right there. And then he becomes that wonderful Savior, the Counselor, 
the uh, mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, for you personally. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not a religion. It's a relationship with the everlasting Father through Jesus, the everlasting Son. What a wonderful thing that is. What a great Savior um, that was came that Jesus, that God came to earth in the person of His Son and was born um, in that stable and was placed in that manger almost 2,000 years ago. The unspeakable gift, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we celebrate that. And on this special day, but all year long, every day, what a wonderful thing that is. That's right. Romans 12 um, says, starting in verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that's for the Christian, as the Lord, through the Apostle Paul, was speaking to the church at Rome. He said this, I beseech you therefore, brother, by the mercy of God, for in your body is a living sacrifice. That's where it begins. So that the government is talking about not having to wait until Jesus comes to earth after the tribulation period. You can and we must surrender our lives as living sacrifices to the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to bear the burden. We don't have to go around trying to shoulder all this pressure and all this weight and all this anxiety and have to be worrying all the time about all this pressure in our life that we have taken on ourselves day after day after day. Jesus, once He became our Savior, He's wanting us to come to Him on a daily basis and surrendering our spirit, souls, and bodies to Him right. after salvation and not worry and not be anxious all the time. But we turn those things over to Him, spirit, soul, and body, lock, stock, and barrel. Um, when you use a, a term on the basis of the old um, black powder rifle terms, where that's all there was to the rifle was a lock, a stock, and a barrel. Um, and we say spirit, soul, and body. Um, that's what we're made of, uh, fashioned after the um, uh, pattern of the Lord, who is uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, uh, a trinity, a Godhead. And so in that pattern, uh, we turn body, soul, and spirit over to Him. So we are living sacrifices. And... Um, so that we can be renewed in the mind and and we are uh, in the fashion of Romans 12, 1 and 2. We also prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so in that fashion of body, spirit, and soul, we just surrender to the Lord and um, He then can live out and through us, in and through us, so that His name becomes wonderful and He's the Counselor, and He's the um, Mighty God, and He's the Everlasting Father, and He's the Prince of Peace. And we're able to take advantage of all that sort of thing so that we rejoice in our relationship with Him. And it's not a humdrum life as a Christian, but it's a rejoicing every single day and, and um, experiencing the peace that passes all understanding and the joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. And um, we uh, take advantage of the fact that we've got an everlasting Father and the uh, omniscience of God in that He's the mighty God is working in and through us every single day. Not that He does give us strength, but He is our strength. And uh, He is so wonderful and we live that out and we are conscious of those things and He's presence. We practice that presence of God because He is the everlasting Father. And we practice those things every single day. That's the unspeakable gift that was given to us when He was born on this earth and we accepted Him as our Father every single day. What a wonderful gift that was. And um, 
we um, um, have to remind ourselves of that and we explore that, but let's not forget that unspeakable gift as we remember that that was given to us. When we were um, privileged and you allowed uh, Brother Daryl and I, uh, by your generosity, uh, to go to Israel, you're back in September, three months ago, um, back in September, we visited the town of Bethlehem. And I'm sure and I'm positive it was <coughs> not like it was back when Jesus was born there and Mary and Joseph traveled there to pay their taxes. But we did look on those fields and we had a brief service there that day sitting on some benches overlooking the shepherd's fields. And we're able to have a few minutes to contemplate what those shepherds might have experienced that night as the angels appeared to them. And there were no shepherds, no sheep in the fields that day, but it was left to our imagination. And it was broad daylight, so that was left to our imagination as well. But that night as they were watching their sheep, and in that bright, clear night, as the single angel appeared to them at first and announced to them that he had glad tidings for them, that in Bethlehem, just adjacent to those fields, that there was a Savior born unto them in the city of David as predicted in the Old Testament in the days of Micah, who was a contemporary of Isaiah 700 years before. Micah was used of God to predict it would be in Bethlehem, Ephrathah. And they were stunned by the appearance of that single solitary angel at first. And then, after he had made that announcement, a great host of angels came and we Reading between the lines a little bit, there was probably some, the angels probably sang out the great news of glad tidings and peace on earth and joy to all men uh, for the whole earth. It was too much to keep quiet and that that message should be spread for the whole earth because it wasn't just to be kept to the shepherds wasn't even just to be kept just to the little town of Bethlehem about six miles from Jerusalem it was to be shared with the whole earth and they couldn't wait they left those flocks and they went to Bethlehem for all these years, most of us have thought that it was in a stable, and there's a good chance it was. And baby Jesus being laid in a manger. There's a possibility it was in a cave. We were taken just adjacent to where we were seated there, and there was a cave. We were Those who wanted to could go down into the cave. There was ample room for the shepherds to get there and uh, ample room for a manger, ample room for Joseph and Mary, and ample room for a straw for the baby Jesus to be laid in and in a manger. There's a sizable cave, but it doesn't mean that that's where it happened, where Jesus was born, but a stable or a cave, either way. But that night, the shepherds came and worship the angels, worship Mary pondered these things in her heart, kept them in her heart. But soon the whole world would know, the town of Bethlehem would know that a Savior was born. And it was not to be kept a private thing. The whole world was to share that this was a wonderful thing that once he's in your heart, as he was with Mary and Joseph and these shepherds, these shepherds spread that good news to the whole town and everyone around. These glad tidings, they couldn't keep quiet. They couldn't stay still. Couldn't, couldn't keep that in. 
and everyone around knew. And it spread from there to the whole countryside. That's what we need to do. We're in within the four walls of this church building, Albury First Baptist Church. And we're to let everyone know that a Savior is born, that He is wonderful, that He takes away the dullness of life. How many people are out there today who are just sick of life, sick of their life? They're so dissatisfied. And that he's the counselor, he's got all the answers. He is the answer. For every decision they need to make, he needs to guide those decisions. We need to leave those decisions with him and fathers and mothers, husbands and wives, young people need to consider him first in every decision. He's the counselor, the counselor, the mighty God. He meets all the demands of life. No reason why we shouldn't lean upon His strength. He is our strength. And He's the everlasting Father. He's there for every dimension of life that you have to be a part of in every dimension of your life. He's the everlasting Father. He's the eternal God. He's the eternal Son. And He's the Prince of Peace. For every disturbance that comes into your life, every single day we have disturbances in our life. He's the Prince of Peace to intervene in all those disturbances and to bring peace in every aspect of your life, to settle every disturbance that comes into your life. He rules and reigns over every one of those and is the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah for a Savior like that. Amen. And the whole world needs to know there's a Savior like that out there. Just like the shepherds made it known. And the whole town knew. What a wonderful Savior. Can't keep that quiet. Got to get out there and let it be known there's a Savior like that. He's the unspeakable gift. One that we can't keep quiet. In other words, there's all kinds of opportunities to do that. And we've got to make it known of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end <coughs> on the house of David to establish his kingdom, to order it, to establish it with judgment, with justice, and henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this with all his heart, with all his desire. God is going to make sure that this will be performed. And he wants to use you and I as a vessel, as a channel, to see that the whole world knows. Let's just make ourselves available to see that God will use us. There's no greater joy, no greater privilege than to be a vessel, a channel for God to use. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, please, and no one looking around. <coughs>